flashback on Thursday. Looking at that chocolate thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just reminded me of how I was in the my cigar. I was so fucking trapped here on Thursday when I was leaving. Um, like, the like, like, vintage. And, like, I was, like, kind of like stumbled up to show up the FD. Will was there, and he was shit faced, and Brent was there. Welcome to Brent. The best state of the week. The best state of the week. Um, goes back, and most of you, most of you guys remember, but when the bars went open Sundays, and Manitoba, of course, great good liquor laws, and, and uh, people would find ways to go out. And, and the best night, it was the best night to go out because all the industry would go out. So people that were in restaurant bars, Fridays, Saturdays, would come out. And remember when cash was a thing? <laughs> nice. <laughs> People like cash. So I, I worked a bar. Um, I worked a bar with some rugby friends uh, called Magetta, and that and that became quite a Sunday hangout. Mom would grapes on the hanging and all that. And uh, we get all the industry stuff. But we get we get uh, the Jets and the Bombers would want to come down, and we had a pretty strict policy: girls first, let the ladies in. And so we wait, the bombers wait, and I, no one knew the bombers back then. It was, it was that, that, that rough era in the 90s. But, so they'd come in, demand to get in, and you know who I am, and all this. And all they wanted to do was pick up girls and fight and not even drink. So we were like, no, industry staff first, and girls, and then you. Maybe. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a good day to drink. We had to get around the liquor laws, and we put out a, a buffet, charged a cover of $5, and then the food was there, which no one ate anyway. <laughs> so, always been a favorite day. So, thank you for coming out Sunday. It's been a rough week. It's been a good week, busy week. And we hosted about five events here. Um, it, was, it was two in one night, back to back. So, I brought Natino down from me. Uh, Natino is right here. <laughs> so, everybody give it to Natino on Wednesday Walk. <laughs> He likes Winnipeg, and so we met last year. And uh, as many of you know, I'm a big Nika fan, and it was just uh, serendipitous that we met. And uh, we got talking one night. I think we we're just at the Fairmont having a couple beer before the event. And he said, I just saw him. I had a whiskey club, and, and we wanted to have him out if he's ever here. And he said, Well, why don't we do something to get the next whiskey festival? So I phoned Thomas Hines and I said, What's What's your availability? This was probably what, three months ago. We started, or four. Yeah. Yes. And I was talking to Rob, and he goes, we're booked all week. Like, I, I'm, booked, I'm double booked even. So I said, what about Sunday? And Rob goes, Sunday works. That's a good idea. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no, we're good with that. I asked Matito if he, if he would hang on another day, and, and he could kind of be obliged. And so um, he said, I'd like to do a master class. And I said, well, I, I know some really smart, smart people. And they're, they're, they're wanting to get, always wanting to get a little more education in them. And uh, I said, I'd like to learn too. I, I won't learn. You can never learn a lot. You're always learning about something. Right? So we, we all learn from each other. And uh, I wanted to hear a little more inner details of what. Nika does because I've always loved the story about Nika, and I, I'm sure Nikita will enlighten you on that. But uh, Masataka Takasuru was his father of Japanese and he has an incredible story. Um, I think I'm going to sit down and get a glass for myself. I'm not going to tell this story. I'm always so damn inspired me. Yeah. The fact that he went to, to Scotland as a young, young, a young man to gain education in the distilling business. Actually, his family we signed up of Zaki uh, Brewers one day. Yeah. And so, but he, he went to University of Glasgow, studied chemistry, and then he did a tenure at Longhorn. Oh, so I, uh, uh, my, my presentation is half done. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it's okay, you don't have to go into that. Yeah, so, anyway. <laughs> and Tina will let you know that. But, but I wanted to have, you know, he came back with the Scottish wife, and that's impressive, yeah. for, for 1920 something. So uh, she moved back to Canada and uh, let him fulfill his dream, which became the distilleries. He'll tell you all about that. But I just wanted to sort of give you this preamble because uh, 
there's a lot to there's a lot to Nico. Uh, there's a lot to, to the different whiskeys we're going to have tonight. Just starting off with with the with the nice nice bottle and, and the Tino will enlighten on that. But uh, when we get to the two, uh, the, the next two, so two and three, we're going to space them all a bit, just so you don't have to think too much. You don't have to worry what's on your left and what's on your right. We're going to we're going to spread them on and off. Uh, but the you know, but those two specifically from two different distilleries, he'll just he'll tell you about why they're different, how they're different, and uh, we'll get into some of the specifics about the whole process from from, from grain to, to glass, and and that's the real nitty gritty stuff. That's the cool stuff that you, you want to know about because that's what makes the whiskey what it is. And there's it's easy to make whiskey, it's easy to make alcohol, it's hard to make good alcohol. It, it really is. So it, it's gonna come, it comes down to a lot of factors. We'll go over some of those, those things. So um, hopefully you, you'll learn a little bit of what's up today. Um, in terms of the cigar, you know, I know you guys have had some, some already, but um, actually, uh, Stephen from Tom's Nines came up with the cigar parent. And I said, you know what, I want, I want to actually have let, let's focus in on this pair, and I, and I gave them the lineup, and I said, you know, which, which whiskey did you want to pair to? And they, they used to, like, they actually go through quite a bit of from the barrel there. So he said, I want to do that one. I said, well, that's great. It's a cask of whiskey. It's rich. And so that's awesome. So he came up with a, with a really neat cigar pairing for that. So that's going to be our second last one. So you're going to get a cigar, and it's going to be a great cigar. And, and the pairing is going to be amazing. I'm, I'm excited about that pair. But if you want to do another cigar in between, the Yoichi is one of my favorite cigar malts. Uh, great ground to have a cigar with. Uh, because it's got a little bit of smoke, because it's rich, he'll tell you why it's rich. Um, but I just want to mention direct fire distills. Coal fire, they're still using coal there, I can't believe it. Uh, Flandronic finished in 05, one of my favorite, anything 305 Flandronic, you'll notice a difference. Still great, well, but I can tell you why, the difference between the two distillers and all that. So, without further ado, Natino, take over, enjoy. If, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Okay, no. and his voice is very much in Italian. Italian, Japanese, I think. Maybe. <laughs> Cheers. All right, thank you. Take care. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for, you know, having the interest and taking the interest to come here today. It's a pleasure to have everybody. And a special thanks to Darren for organizing all this. Darren, thank you. It's my pleasure. And to Thomas Hines for providing the facility. Thank you, It's nice to have you. Ladies are right out of the first round, gents and ladies. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce you ladies. If I may, Zoe and Callie. And Mel. Sorry, 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 Kelly and Mel, and I am here. I'm the help tonight. <laughs> Why are you down here? He's the poor. <laughs> And it actually came to Manitoba probably around 2014. So it's not new here, but it kind of is. Because uh, it was limited, not much product was available to come into uh, Manitoba. So we would get, I think the, ori the original one was uh, from the barrel and Akatsuru, which is the ones that came here. But they were hard to get, and they would come and they would go, it's sell out. So in reality, we are sort of almost like new being here. We started last year with the, the core, the majority of the core brands being available, and again uh, this year. This is why we're doing, it. it's a great pleasure to be able to do this event. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to do this event yes. uh, here today to be able to teach uh, uh, and tell you a little bit of what Nika is all, all about. Now, yes. A little bit. Higher? You share Italian. Oh, yeah. Let's look okay. out the arms. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, around the year 2000, uh, Japanese whiskey was non existent. It was basically dead in the water outside of Japan. It just didn't exist. A lot of the most important distilleries, like 
Hanyu, Karuizawa, they were closed down. The only two distillers left over were Nika and Santori. And they're the only ones that were basically uh, continuing on. Everything else was closed down. So there was no interest whatsoever until 2001 when the, at the World Whiskey Awards, Nika submitted the Yuichi 10-year-old in the under 12 classification. And it won best whiskey in the world in its class, including best uh, be beating out all the Scotch whiskeys. So that's put Japanese whiskey back on the map. I'm going to go on the other side. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was um, it won a best whiskey in the world, 2001, under the uh, 12 uh, uh, year old uh, classification. So that was quite an accomplishment because it, it brought uh, Japanese whiskey back into the limelight. And so what happened then um, is what we've experienced uh, over the past several years. Um, there was a lot of Japanese age statements available. There was, you know, the, your 12-year-old. Nika had 12, they had 10, they had 15, 17, 20, they had 25, they had 35 and 40-year-old whiskeys. And what happened was the smart guys in Europe that realized this, they bought everything. They bought everything. There's nothing late, nothing available anymore. So what happened was scarcity, no product available, prices went up. People were asking more and more for these. Year after year, Nika and Suntory were winning awards, winning more and more awards, best in class. Takatsuru 17, Takatsuru 21, best uh, blended pure malt in the world uh, for six, seven years in a row. So the Japanese whiskey became so popular globally, huge demand, and so these distributors were taking advantage and the prices go, went up and up and up. When I first brought in the Takatsuru 21, it was $159. Today it's $1,500. Oh, oh. Same product. It's, it's, it's just, it's just, out. it's just crazy. But that's uh, right. Karuizawa. I, I offered Karuizawa to uh, BC and Alberta in 2012. The the No Mask 41. It was um, $299. So the retailer said, "No, nah, we don't want that. It's too expensive. We don't want it. Couldn't sell it. Fine." Last year. I went back to them, I said, hey, remember that whiskey that you guys, nobody wanted? It is now $29,000, oh. same whiskey. <laughs> so it goes to uh, Karimiza, which is a closed distillery that, that I mentioned, and Hanyu, like uh, Chichibu, Ichiro's mom, there's a lot of the Hanyu, uh, Ich um, Ichiro. His grandfather had uh, the uh, Hanyu distillery, so he had a lot of barrels there, and, and so, he was able to mix with his Chichibu whiskeys. And those, like the, if you guys know the card series, those sold for, I think, $350,000. This stuff is just crazy expensive, unbelievable, yeah. And again, it's a scarcity. It doesn't mean that those whiskeys are worth that much. Well, for some collectors they are, but you know, otherwise, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been crazy. But Japanese whiskey, what is Japanese whiskey? I mean, Japanese whiskey, the whole, the, the birth of Japanese whiskey, the creation, the development of Japanese whiskey is all owed to the founder of Nika. So there's a special connection between Nika and the development of Japanese whiskey. And, and the founder's name is, Darren mentioned it, right here, Masataka Takitsuru. He's known as the father of, of Japanese whiskey. Um, he is basically, the seed from which the tree grew to become Japanese whiskey. He was the, the innovator, the creator. He was the guy that started it all way back in 1920, well, we'll get to that, in the early 20s. And so he taught everyone else how to make whiskey uh, himself. <clears throat> now, how did it start? Takatsuru was, his family was in the sake business. So, the, uh, his family wanted to send them to Scotland to learn chemical engineering uh, uh, and, and uh, to learn the art of distillation. So imagine, we're talking about 1918 now. Takasuru is 24 years old. He's a young man, very courageous, very determined, 
And so he sets off with a suitcase. In those days, they had no wheels, by the way. The suitcase, his notebook, and his pencils. And he got on a ship, not on a plane, 16 hours and you're there, it's a ship. So he travels across the Pacific Ocean, four weeks to get to the west coast of the uh, United States. Where he gets on a train, he travels another two weeks to get to the east coast of the United States. And then he gets on another ship to go up to Glasgow. That's another three weeks. That's like over two months to get to where he's going, not 16 hours. So I guess that's to me that, that, that gives a dedication and, and determination to, to do something. And you know, nowadays uh, we complain about a uh, one hour uh, ride to get to work, right? <laughs> But yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's amazing. So when he's there, he goes to Glasgow, he enrolls in the university and uh, in chemical engineering. And while he's there, he also apprentices at three distilleries. So he, dis uh, he apprentices at three distilleries to learn the art of distillation. So at one of the distilleries, he learns the art of making malt whiskeys, single malts, how to do malting, all that stuff. On the second distillery, he learns the art of making grain whiskey. That's a different type of uh, process. And at the third distillery, he learns the art of blending, which is very, very important, especially for Japanese. Because the Japanese, they don't share, they don't share uh, barrels with each other. So they have to make everything in-house in order to be able to create different types of whiskey. Whereas in Scotland, if you don't have a peated whiskey, you go to your friend down the, in Ida and buy a barrel from him and mix it into your property. You can do that. The Japanese don't do that, so they have to create everything in house. And then, so he learned all this information uh, and all these three distilleries. And he was such an avid learner, he just fell in love with this stuff. You can see these are some of the original notes that he did, his writing. And on the on the left, the bottom left here, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, the drawing that he made from the Hazelburn pot still, and that is the pot still that he made from the drawing on the, the on the right. That's a Yuichi. That's that was developed from his drawing. As you, as you, as you can see, it's coal fire. Yeah, so it's, it's quite, a, quite an amazing, yeah, an amazing thing. And do you know Hazelburn has a pretty good following there? Oh, oh yeah, I don't know. It was its own distillery back uh, uh, Caltown had, had, had almost up to 30 distilleries, and I think mm. that was barely with one. Uh, so that's what makes Hazelburn now as a recipe unpeated, but it was heavily peated back then. Yeah, yeah. That's where he got uh, his passion for. Yeah, so he, you know, he fell in love, and you can see that that drawing is exactly like almost pretty well what what, what he developed uh, back at, uh, in Japan. He got it made just the same way, all his notes and how to do everything, and he learned how from the masters, you know, the Scotch, like they made the great whiskies in those days, and he went there and he learned from the masters how to make whiskey properly, not to make it some other way, you know. So and that's that's what. Uh, what, what is really fascinating about, about this. So, we're going to start off with the first whiskey that you receive. Okay, that's the uh, Nika Days. Uh, now, Nika Days uh, is the latest uh, creation from Nika. The whole idea behind this whiskey is to make a very approachable, a drinkable, easy drinking whiskey, a daily dram, something that you can have, you know, without thinking, uh, much about it, uh, just to, to enjoy, and and it's also very very good for um, for making uh, cocktails. So the the liquid is actually quite nice, as you can see here. The cask composition, the dominant uh, oak that they use in this is a refill, refill barrel. So these are old barrels that were used for um, other products, and then they're refilled again. So that's the dominant. Now these particular barrels, like the refill, the remain, the rechar, they're older barrels, and what they do, they basically act almost as a vessel to hold the barrel without changing the flavor of the whiskey in there. So when you taste a, a, a whiskey that is from those types of barrels, 
you're really tasting the flavor of the grain that's in that whiskey. Yes. Are the barrels? Uh, well, these are barrels that some of them remade, recharged, uh, uh, ex bourbon barrels, or other barrels, new barrels that have been used before. Some of them are 20 to 30 years of age. So they, so they don't really impart a lot of flavor to the whiskey, but it allows it to evolve on its own. And you're tasting the, uh, the, the characteristics of that grain, whether it's barley, uh, corn, whatever it is, so you're gonna taste the sweetness of those uh, uh, grains in, in the whiskey. Now, getting, getting back to what you were saying, so are those barrels, some from Kentucky, some from America, and they strictly from Japan? No, what they have their own cooperage that they make okay. their own new American oak barrels yeah. and make it there, and they're used over time. Right. But if they have, like for example, uh, so the dominant here we have refill and recharge. So recharge is probably a, a barrel that's been. It could be a bourbon barrel that's been recharged, scraped and recharged again. It could be a new, a new barrel that's been scraped and recharged. Or it could be just a barrel that's just recharred more. Because once it's used several times, it loses. It loses the, 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 the charring, right? So, and that's what they do. So, those two, with the double circle, those are the dominant oak that they use. After that, we have more remade and ex bourbon. Now, remade is, is a barrel that's been used before, and then they, they clean it all out, clean everything out, and make it remade, like new, and then they rechar it. A lot of the charring that Nika uses is all medium toast. They don't do heavy charring or anything like that. And then the ex bourbon uh, is uh, the other uh, barrel that they use in this particular uh, blend. There is also, to a, a lesser degree, a little bit of sherry and a little bit of new American oak. Somebody asked me what those uh, triangles mean, and I, I had a master class. I said, that, that's the, they get the barley from Egypt. <laughs> so I'm glad you guys got it. So, that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but yeah, the uh, the triangle is the least amount uh, of uh, of oak influence in in that particular uh, whiskey, and the X means zero. So we can taste this uh, whiskey, and you can tell me what you guys think. Whiskey is uh, seventy five percent grain and twenty five percent malt. So the grain is basically corn and barley. So corn, as you know, is a very sweet uh, grain because you know, bourbons, right? And, and if you ever bit into a corn on the cob, it's so sweet, delicious, right? So you're gonna get a lot of uh, burnt sugar coming through here. Some some of these, the smoke and the peak in the background, but the sweetness is always there. Nice, easy drinking, a dram, okay? Not overly complex, but that's not the, 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 the idea of the it's just like, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very smooth. Oh, that was great. That was great. Okay. Fun packaging, bright colors. That's the whole idea to make it like a daily drag type of thing. Right. Now, why is it like that? If you see a lot of the whiskeys today, you know, in, in, around the COVID, when we had COVID. There was a big, huge influx of Japanese whiskeys. They all snuck in from the back door because nothing was happening. There were no trade shows, there's nothing going on. And so all these whiskeys, all these new distilleries that sort of opened up in uh, 2018, 2019, they're coming in with 15-year-old whiskeys, 12-year-old whiskeys, 10-year-old whiskeys. Really? Where do you get the whiskey from? <laughs> you, you just started yesterday. You know, I don't know. So. The thing is with Jap Japan doesn't have strict laws like Scotland. They, they, they restrict people. There is kind of like a, a wild west. And so uh, people can do whatever they want. And if you don't have it, you go get it. And, you know, so you're getting, we did get a lot of whiskey with you know, samurai soldiers, uh, Mount Fuji, or, you know, cherry blossoms everywhere, and calling it Japanese whiskey. But as you as a consumer, uh, I would say when you go and buy a whiskey, uh, ask whether or not it is real, true Japanese, because um, they don't have the strict laws that other countries do. So if you're in Japan, you can go and get whiskey in India, bring it over, 
put a samurai soldier on there and call it Japanese, and then put some three-year-old in there. Whatever, you, they can do that. Uh, however, they have implemented uh, new laws. They have implemented new laws now, where taking it into effect April 1st of this year, um, you cannot call a whiskey Japanese whiskey unless it's made in Japan. Now you can import your ingredients like your barley because you know, Japan doesn't make enough. Uh, just like everyone imports barley from everywhere. Uh, but you cannot call it Japanese whiskey unless you make it in Japan. The trouble with that is it's an association that you have to belong to. So the honest people, the honest distilleries who belong to it and do it proper, but the rogue ones who don't want to have anything to do with that, they just won't join and they continue to do whatever they want. So it would be nice if they were a little bit stricter with their laws because it's, it's, it's important because as a consumer, you want to buy a true Japanese whiskey, not something that, you know, Suntory and Nika built uh, the reputation of Japanese whiskey over the past 20, 24 years and brought it to where it was today. But all these other new distilleries are coming in and capitalizing on instead of charging a lot of money for new whiskeys that are only maybe three or four years old, right? So is there a way to tell if it's part of the association? Uh, not yet, uh, but um, we are going to talk to them to maybe they can come up with uh, some kind of a, a crest or a, a something that you can put on the back label or a strip on top of the, uh, the bottle so that people will know something. Because if you're not, you know, if you're not the Japanese whiskey, you shouldn't call it Japanese whiskey. It, look, Suntory does the AO, but they don't say that it's Japanese whiskey, it's world whiskey. Yeah, they, you know, they say it, yeah? whatever is Japanese, that's how it, that's being transparent. And you know, Nika and Suntory, they're transparent distilleries, <coughs> they try to be honest. Now, what I, just to get back to what I was saying, here you don't see any Japanese kind of like uh, uh, images or the Japanese writing uh, on this model. And the reason being is because there's a little bit of foreign whiskey in there. A little bit of foreign whiskey, maybe 5%. Maybe. I don't know how much because we don't know. But, there's a, but they are transparent and honest, so they won't put the, the, the samurai and all that kind of stuff. So now, my guess is that they're bringing in the whiskey from Ben Nevis. That is a distillery that Nika owns in Scotland. They own that distillery. So even though it's foreign whiskey, it still belongs to them. It's their whiskey that they make over there. Um, also, um, because uh, they own that distillery, all their peated barley, because there's no peat in, in Japan that you can use uh, to make peated barley. So what they do is they peat their barley in Scotland and they send it to Japan for processing. So they probably do that at the Ben Nevis uh, distillery as well. So just to be uh, just to be honest, to let you know, this is why uh, this does not have all those uh, uh, Japanese characters and, and images on on the bottom. How long does it stay in the barrel? This one? Uh, well, this is a combination uh, because it's not an age statement. Yes. Anywhere from a, a young uh, a young barrel, uh, like three years up to up to ten, nine to ten. <coughs> Because this one is more easy, approachable style, probably I would say more younger whiskeys, maybe up to eight years of age, type of thing like that. So, all right. So, Katsura was at school at the university there. He was by himself. He was in Scotland all by himself. And, you know, one day this young lady uh, invited him over to come to the house for, for tea, just to be hospitable, just to be a, a nice person. The poor guy was by himself, you know, what's he gonna do? So, so he goes, he goes, well, thank you very much, this is awesome. He goes to the house and uh, he goes and sits in the parlor and he's having tea with this young lady. Now, while he's having tea, who walks in is her sister, Jessie Roberta Cowell. Now she, it's not about picking up girls today, I said. Don't you forget. That's why she's gone. <laughs> so she walks into the parlor and joins them to have tea. Well, I think, maybe, you know, uh, love at first sight, it happens. You know, it does happen. <laughs> but imagine, we're, we're talking about like 1918, 1919, 
from then. Um, an interracial marriage. You have this Japanese guy in Scotland. Imagine all those Highlanders going, ah, what are you doing here? Trying to steal our women, you know? That kind of thing. So it wasn't happening. It was it was quite a it was quite a, an amazing thing to see uh, this happening. But they fell in love. They were they were court they they courted, they, they were together for two years, and then finally they uh, they got married in 1920. So when they got married in 1920, in 1921, they went back to uh, Japan uh, together. But when they got there, because um, there were no distilleries in Japan at the time, uh, he had nothing to do, basically unemployed. Now, around that time, in 1921, 22, there was a young man in Japan, a businessman. His name is, was Shinjiro Tori. Now, this young man wanted to build a distillery and make whiskey in Japan. Okay, so, uh, what, what's he gonna do? He's got tons of money and he wants to build a distillery. So he gets his entourage of people and he goes and he goes to Scotland with all his people. And he goes from distillery to distillery to distillery looking for a master distiller and asking questions. Who can I find? What do I got? Who do you got? And then at one distillery, he's there and somebody says to him, why did you come here to find a master distiller? You have a really good one in Japan. And he also speaks Japanese. Hey, that's pretty good. You know, just imagine having a Scottish guy there trying to speak Japanese with his people. So they go, they go home. What, what do you mean? Who is this guy? And they said, Masataka Takatsuru. He was here. He spent three years with us. And he is really, really good. He knows about whiskey. He, he makes whiskey like the scotch, like, like we do. He learned everything from uh, our people. He sh should go back and look him up. So he goes, OK. So he decides to get his entourage again. and. Back to Japan they go, he looks them up, finds them together, they, they work on developing this distillery, and in 1923, they opened up the distillery, uh, which we all know today as Yamazaki. So that was the beginning of Japanese whiskey, that was the first distillery. You had Shinjiro Tori, who had the money and the business sense, and Takatsuro, who had the brains and the skills of producing whiskey. So together, uh, he produced, he gave him the distillery, which was uh, a consumer's dream. And, and so he, uh, he was there and he began doing, he was the master distiller, he was the master blender, he was the master everything. He was basically the big boss of masters, you know? <laughs> so, and, uh, and it was there that he taught all the people how to make whiskey. All his disciples, all these people who wanted to learn about making whiskey and because he couldn't do it all himself so he taught them the scottish way to make whiskey and that's where the birth that's where the birth of japanese whiskey happened at yamazaki with takasuru at the helm teaching everybody how to make whiskey and so that's how that's how it happened so he signed a 10-year contract to work at, at yamazaki so after several years of doing this um, there was a different a difference in the philosophy Shinjiro Tori, who was a businessman, was all about making money. Takasuru, who was a master and a creator, he wanted to make good whiskey, real whiskey. He wanted to make age statements. Shinjiro Tori, he's not gonna wait 10 years to sell whiskey. He wanted to make money. So he wanted to make cheap, everyday whiskey. Three years, boom, out, sell it, make money, bring more, make more. So he didn't want to wait so long. So basically they differed in their philosophy. And eventually, Takasura left. He left after 10 years, his 10-year ten, ten tenure, he left. However, when he left, well, he, he had no money. He didn't have enough money to open up his distillery. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna have to find people. So this is where Rita comes in. So Rita, being, of course, English, but she also played the piano. So being English, she taught English uh, at uh, she did uh, English lessons and being a piano player she also taught piano now in those days who had children for themselves who would 
learn English and who would play the piano. Basically affluent people, rich people, rich Japanese. So she was very well connected with all people with money. Therefore, she was able to get investors to uh, uh, realize uh, Takatsura's dream to build a distillery. And so they had enough money then because of her that he was able to get these investors to, to create the first distillery, uh, which became uh, Yoichi. Uh, she is also now known as the uh, mother of Japanese whiskey because of her contribution. You know, because you're probably thinking, why are we even seeing all his wife? Why are we even talking about his wife at, at, at a whiskey taste? Well, you, you could see how important she was in the original uh, development of the first distillery that Nika had, which is uh, Yoichi. That is Yoichi Distillery right there in the winter. As you can see, that is on the north island of Japan, uh, in Hokkaido, near Sapporo. Uh, of course, being in the north, it's uh, a little bit colder. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's more like highland, a little cold, the cold temperature, so slower maturation uh, in the barrels. So this was built in 1934 in Hokkaido on the North Island. And there they produced malt whiskey. And the, uh, the water source for the whiskeys came from the underground water source of Yuriki River, which runs right by the uh, distillery. There it is right there. Yuriki River runs right by the distillery, and the underground wells are from that, for the water source. And you can see in the background there, the Sea of Japan. So you can see the location where it's at, the terroir is so close to the sea. So you're gonna get the marine influence coming through. You're gonna get the ocean breeze coming through. You're gonna get the brininess. You will get the, um, the iodine, that, that you're gonna get some of those characteristics through the aging process of the whiskey because of the proximity to the ocean. Here it is in the winter again, another picture. And that little house in the background there, that is Takatsuru's house. That's the little house that's where they lived, him and his wife. They never had any kids, no children. I was in that house actually, it's a tiny little place. We went, we wanted to go in there, and right away they gave me little slippers. They got my shoes. <laughs> Japanese style. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And there it is in the summer. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so you probably don't know the, the town in Manitoba called Cowan, Manitoba. Cowan, Manitoba? Cowan. No. Yeah. Do you know that prior picture with all the snow? That could be Thomas or This one? Yeah. Oh. It could be Thomas. So like it could wow. Be, it could cool. be near Adam or near uh, Tanatan. Uh, oh. Lots of snow. I have there. Cool. 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 But the, there's a Cowan family in Manitoba. And I don't know if there's any uh, connection relation. I don't, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> my my great great grandfather was Robert Cowan. Oh. Well, <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. 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 For sure. I'll I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do that and let me know. <laughs> uh, so there it is in the summer. Right. There's the house in the back again. Over here we have, these are the warehouses where they house all of the, all the whiskeys for aging. As you can see, in, you know, in the winter it's pretty cold there, so this, the aging process is slow, just much like, like Scotland is. This is why he wanted to find something uh, in, in, in an area which reminded him of like the highlands of, of Scotland, so that you know, he had the same sort of uh, um, aging potential for the whiskeys that the, the Scottish had. And because he wanted to make whiskey that were really Scottish in style. And here, these are the pot stills that they use at Yorichi that we saw from the drawing. Those, uh, those three in the, uh, in, on the right side, th those three are the original drawings from Takatsuru that he got from Hazelburn. And uh, those three are coal fired even today. You can see this gentleman right here. The pot stills are there. A, uh, there's a temperature gauge there in front. Basically, this gentleman, his job is to put coal in the fire. And that's what he does. Every seven minutes, roughly, he goes and puts coal in. Now, the temperature of that coal fire 
but still is 1,000 degrees. 1,000 degrees. I'm not talking about like nowadays. There are about 200. 1,000 degrees. So imagine, imagine the fire intensity at the bottom, at the core of, of this pot still. You're gonna have the core, the bottom will have intense heat and the, and the heat diffuses as it goes out. So you're gonna get the type of uh, vapor, the distillation vapor that comes through the bottom will be a lot different than the one that comes from the sides, that is lower temperature. You know, the lower temperature you allow for more flavors to come through. The, the higher, the higher uh, degree temperature, uh, more refined uh, uh, vapors going up. And so you get all this different differentiation from this uh, coal-fired pot still that you don't get from modern stills. You can see there how intense that is. That's pretty crazy, pretty wild. There's three processes. I think they are the only distillery left now in the world that still has coal-fired pots. And it, it's, it's amazing. So the, that guy's job is to do this for seven hours, and then he leaves in eight hours, and then he leaves and another one comes on and does that, and that's their job. As you can see, the temperature anywhere from 800 to 1,000 degrees. As soon as that temperature drips below, he goes and puts more coal in. All right, so now we're gonna try the next whiskey, which is uh, Yoichi. So this is the, uh, the whiskey from the original distillery, 1934. And over here, you're gonna see that the dominant oak influence in this whiskey is New American oak, X sherry. There is no bourbon, no bourbon at all. And then the remade and recharred is the, the next one. And to a lesser degree, a little bit of refill. <coughs> so here you're gonna get, it's a 45% 45, uh, 45 uh, alcohol. Direct fire, of course, distillation in the pot stills. And here they use the peated malt, uh, the peated sort of barley that they get from uh, Scotland. They use it in this particular uh, whiskey a lot more than the, the other the other distillery. So you're going to get, you know, you're going to get from the New American oak, you're going to get those uh, uh, those oak, oak notes. You're going to get a bit of that spiciness in there. The sherry will give the, the sherry will give the more of the, the plums, the red cherry, and also a bit of pear in there as, as well. <coughs> but what I like about this whiskey is it's got the peat and it has the smoke, but it's really well integrated into the whiskey. It's, it creates a really balanced dram because you know there's 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 ways that you can use the peat and the smoke that sometimes that overpowers the whiskey. You don't taste anything else. Here, you're gonna get the peat, you're gonna get the smoke, but you're also gonna get the, the fruity notes coming through from the sherry cask influence. You're gonna get more a bit of the oakiness, a little bit of the, uh, the spice coming through as well. It's really nicely balanced whiskey and really well integrated with, with the peat and the smoke. That, that's what I like about this. Uh, it's not over the top, it dominates, nothing really dominates. It's, it, it's, you could almost, for those people who are don't like peated whiskeys, you could almost kind of ease them in with something like this, just to give them a, a sample, because they're not so offensive, because some are so powerful that you know you have to be a big fan of peat and smoke in order to really appreciate those really heavy peated whisk whiskeys. Not like the big peat. It's not like the big peat at all. This is the Mihegikyo distillery on the South Island of Japan. Uh, built in 1969 in the Miyagi Prefecture. Uh, it's um, just north of Tokyo, around Sendai. And it's also on, it was, Yoichi was on the coast. This one is up high in the mountains. And here they make malt whiskey and grain whiskey. So this was, is high up in the mountains, very pristine. Very pristine area, all clean and beautiful. And there's the Nikawa River on one side and the Hirozi uh, River on the other. And the Nikawa River is the, uh, the water source where they get the, the water for the, uh, for the whiskeys that made at Miyagikyo on the underground. This is the Nikawa River, as you can see, it's beautiful. Uh, there's snakes along there too. Uh, when I was there, snakes. That's 
poisonous? <laughs> Maybe not good for swimming. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's, it's just beautiful. So pristine and clean. It's just beautiful there. Did you try the water in Tito from there, like right from the river? I know. I was too scared to go in there. I didn't try that. It was not me. Is, is, is Nikawa where the, the etymology of Nika? No, it's, no. Nika okay. came from, uh, in, at the very beginning of Nika, because you guys know, when you open up a distillery, you don't have whiskey. Right, so you have basically nothing. So at the beginning, Nika uh, was because I, I, in Yuichi uh, on the North Island, there there was a lot of apples. A lot of apples were growing there. So they created a company called Nippon Ka, Kawa, Ka something, whatever. It, it's a long Japanese name, and so then they shortened it to Nika. So what they used to do at the very very beginning was they would make apple juice, apple cider, and apple brandy. And that's how they were able to survive. They had cash flow to pay the workers while their, their whiskeys were aging. It takes three years, right? So they couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, do that. So, and, and that's where... And you so, have gin now. <laughs> yeah, so, so they, could, they had that name which incorporated the apple, but then they shared the tanita to get rid of the other. The other names that were referencing the, uh, the apple uh, parts. Oh. So, as you can see here, these are the warehouses at uh, Miyagikyo. Uh, the big picture, you can see you get snow there because it's higher up in the mountains, higher altitude. Again, it's colder, slower maturation. Uh, uh, so, you can see how the how Takatsuru, when he was planning his, his, uh, his uh, uh, locations, his terroirs, where he would get to the, the, the ideal conditions that were similar to Scotland, and less of the, uh, uh, the marine influence. And you can see here, these are the, uh, the pot stills that are in uh, Miyagikyo. They're more modern, and here you can see uh, the pot stills are um, steam, uh, they're gas fired. So you're gonna have a more, uh, a more um, uniform uh, heating and lesser temperature, okay? So uh, not like the intensity that you get from, from your each. So you have a more elegant whiskey, a bit more refined, and you will get more fruitiness coming through in this type of whiskey, more elegance. And that is due to the, uh, the line arms. Now here, the line arm, for example, it, in Yorichi, you can see the uh, line arm is descending, okay? It's descending. So what happens, you get the intensity, you have all this intensity of the heat in the distillation process. As the vapor goes up into the, uh, into the line arm, um, because of the uh, diffused heat, a lot of the, um, heavier components of the vapor go into the line arm, and because it's descending down, some of those heavier components, they fall into the new make, into the uh, condenser, and they become new make. So you're gonna get whiskey that will have more flavor, more boldness, more structure, right? Whereas at Mihegikyo, you can see the line arm going upwards. It's, it's ascending. Okay, so as the vapors go up, the heavier components go to the line arm, and because it's going upward, gravity pulls them down. Thank you. So you will get more refined vapor, a more elegant vapor coming through that goes into the condenser and goes and becomes new made. And here you're going to get the elegance of the whiskey coming through, and also the, the style to be more uh, sweet. Now we're in the master class. We're talking about line arms. <laughs> <laughs> now we officially. We I'm about there you go. There you go. Awesome. So it makes it makes sense. It makes total yeah. sense. You, you have your Ichi, you get you know, the, the descending line arm will allow more of the heavy components to go into the condenser. And you get more structure type like, type like of whiskey. You know, every still is different. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So oh yeah, as you can see, the indirect steam is it, it's at 266 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas Yorichi was thousand degrees, eight hundred degrees. Big, big difference. Big difference. So low and slow. Yeah. 
So now we've got the Mie Gikyo uh, single malt. Again, 100% malted barley, of course. 45% uh, alcohol. The dominant oak in this particular dram is sherry cask. That is the, the dominant oak that we use in this particular uh, whiskey. There's a little bit of new American oak, a little bit of bourbon, refilled, remade, and recharged in equal, equal parts. But here you will get, because the sherry cask is the dominant cask, you will get those sweet sort of uh, red cherry notes coming through, some plums and red berries, right? A little bit of the raisiny, raisin characteristic, right? Uh, right fruits coming through. And then the refill, remain to recharge, to allow for the, the sweetness uh, of, of the actual barley to come through, because uh, those are, like I said, the vessels that basically house uh, the new make yeah. without changing the, uh, the flavor profile. So you, you get the sweetness that comes through is from the barley, from the, those three last three barrels. You're gonna get the, the new American oak will have, uh, will add a little bit of that, the, the oakiness to it, that vanilla, a little bit of that uh, spice, a tiny bit of spice. And the sherry is the dominant one where you're gonna get all the red fruits, right? And then the bourbon, the bourbon will give you that, that bit of smoke. You can get a little bit of that smoke. There's a little bit of heat and smoke in this whiskey, but it's more at the end, at the background. At the very end of the whiskey, you, you get a little bit, a touch of a little smoke coming through here. More elegant, yeah. more fruity, right? Yeah. All about this special still that they got from Scotland in 1963, and, and how, um, you know, it's 95% corn, but how they have to have 5% barley, uh, just for, or else they have to add, at right, they have to, they have to cheat and, and, and make it a little bit more commercial, so it's natural to add, add the barley and infused. Um, so it, it's a pretty cool whiskey. Um, my story on it actually uh, is a rugby connection. I, I, I knew the whiskey, but I, I was doing a wine show, and I was over in, in, uh, in Germany, and there's a, a rugby connection, a guy from the wine uh, was over there. So I was talking to some couple of friends, oh, you gotta look him up, he's in Frankfurt, you're flying out of Frankfurt. So I said, okay, I looked him up. So he met me in the airport, we took one train, it took us like five minutes from the airport, and we sat down and, and of course had a couple of really good German beers, as a little, you know, what, you know, clean, clean the dust off the palate, and then uh, he said, you're a whiskey guy, he said, I've come across this Japanese whiskey, Called coffee I love, so we're, I'm in Frankfurt with a, an old rugby buddy drinking coffee today, which is really cool. Yeah. So uh, whis whiskey, um, it, it, it's like music, it transcends the world. And um, you know what, uh, they're drinking scotch in, in, in the deepest parts of Africa, and they're drinking Japanese whiskey in, in all around the world, and, and it's just a, such a cool thing nowadays that um, and everyone shares that passion, that love. And, and we get around and try it, so. I don't think Zimbabwe makes a whiskey yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looks like everyone is. Not but yet, but not, not Zimbabwe, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, we'll get some whiskey out to you folks. I'll let Tino take All right. it from there, and uh, enjoy. Okay, so to continue on, on this little adventure. So, you know, of course, making whiskey is not so simple. There's a lot of factors. The diversifying factors are your ingredients, you know, your, your, your barley, your, your rye, your, your wheat, your corn, whatever it is that you're using. It's very, very important. Mashing, and you create the mash bill from which uh, the fermentation will take place where the, uh, <coughs> the enzymes start doing the fermentation process. And the dis distillation that we talked about in, in the pot stills, uh, a very, very, very important. Sorry, here we go. Very important the distillation process, where the new make gets made, and then that new make gets put into the uh, maturation into the barrels. Uh, all those components make the whiskey. Very important. So then, uh, we've already talked about the terroir, which is the location, and uh, the casks. Now the casks are also very very important. And uh, Anika, they use like we saw, new oak, ex bourbon, ex sherry. Recharge, remade, and refill uh, barrels. So here's the examples of the barrels that they have at Nika. 
On the right, you have the bourbon barrel. It's like a small barrique type of a barrel. Next to it is the hogshead. There's a little short, stubby, little bit fatter barrel. The new punching barrel that's new that they make on site. That they make those barrels on site. And then the ex sherry cask, a butt. That comes from, of course, from Spain. The, they go to Spain and select, hand select all these casks. As they do the bourbon barrels, they go to the United States to select those. Uh, as you can see here, they have their own uh, cooperage. On the right there, you see the brand new barrels that are, that are being made. Uh, there's the, uh, the uh, equipment that does all the charring. Uh, they char all the barrels. You can see the, how the char is. That's a medium char barrel uh, at the bottom that they do on, on site uh, at, at both uh, Yoichi, Miyagikyo, and Tuji, Tokiji distilleries. Now, <clears throat> today, uh, now we're gonna talk about Miyagikyo, the grain whiskey production. Now, at Miyagikyo, they have a special uh, column still. It's called the coffee column still. It's named after Aeneas Coffee, who is the inventor so it is not the flavor of the whiskey. It doesn't have any coffee beans. It's not a Starbucks special. <laughs> it is a real uh, coffee. It's like Paul Coffee, the hockey player. Yeah, that's uh, and so the uh, Aeneas Coffee invented this particular still back in 1830 because back then there was a big demand for whiskeys. And so they needed, so the pot stills were too slow. They couldn't make whiskey fast enough. So he invented a still that did continuous distillation. Because with a pot still, you, you distill what you got, and then you gotta clean it out and put more in, it takes too long. Here it's continuous, it just never stops distilling. It just shoots out whiskey like crazy. So, and that's how he invented this distill. He's an Irish guy. And so this is a, the type of still that Takatsuru uh, uh, learned about at the James Collar, which is the bonus distillery when he was there in uh, 1918, 1919. Uh, so this particular still is very difficult to operate. It's big, it's cumbersome, and, but they've got over 60 years of experience, so they can do it. I think probably they are the only distillery, maybe, in, in, that are still using the, this type of stuff. There might be a couple of other ones, but uh, not, not very many, because of the difficulty of this particular still. Now there it is. That is a monster still that is 40 feet high. It's huge, it's massive. It's huge. It was brought into uh, uh, Miyagiko in 1963. Uh, um, actually, uh, it was in, at another distillery first. It was brought at Miyagiko in 1963. Uh, again, as I say, over 50 years of experience. And it's, it's a particular way to operate this in order to, uh, in order to, uh, to do this. However, what makes this uh, still special compared to modern column stills, is this allows a lot of the flavor of the particular grain to be retained in the new make. A lot of the modern stills, they're too, they strip too much flavor away, a lot of the modern stills. So you know, this is why today, they only make grain whiskey in column stills. Uh, Nika actually makes a malt whiskey in this column still, which is extremely unique. And we we're hoping to maybe bring it into, a, uh, uh, into Manitoba this year. It's called a coffee malt. And that one is made with 100% malted barley. And it is unique, because uh, I think they are the only distillery in the world that can actually do a malt whiskey in a column still. But nobody does it because modern stills strip too much flavor away, and you're gonna get a, a malt whiskey that doesn't taste at all like any malt. But because this allows for a lot of the flavors to come in, uh, they, they do a malt whiskey uh, in a column still. And it's fantastic. I have it, it's, it's loaded with tropical fruits, bananas, uh, apricots and peaches. It's, it's, it's a great, great whiskey. So we're hoping to get that in here uh, uh, this year. So that is the uh, column still that they use for making great whiskey and me and so the next whiskey that we're going to taste is the coffee, Nika coffee, grain. So this whiskey is made with 95% corn and 5% barley. Now, the function of the barley is they use the barley for the enzymes so that 
Uh, corn by itself generally doesn't start the fermentation process. So they put the barley in to start the process of the fermentation, and then once the fermentation is started, then the corn kicks in. Right? And then the, the sugar gets processed into alcohol. But the, the barley is very important for that, for that aspect. Now, with this whiskey, you're going to see no American oak, no sherry, and no bourbon. It's all the remade, refilled, and recharred barrels. So here, you're going to get a whiskey that is aged in barrels that are quite old. And they are, like, like I said before, they are vessels that hold the whiskey. So you will get the true, authentic flavor of the grains that are in that particular whiskey because the, uh, the actual barrels don't impart a lot of flavor and change, like, like a sherry cask will do. The new American Oak will do, the bourbon casks, they add their own characteristics to that, to that whiskey. So you're gonna get a pure corn type of whiskey here with, 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 with the barley. And uh, you could almost say this is bourbon-esque in the sense that it is made with corn, it just doesn't have any other whiskey, any other except barley. Like bourbon will have uh, some rye, you might have some wheat, and the, the degree of the charring will change the, the flavor of the bourbon. Light char, medium char, or heavy char, some are really dark or heavy char uh, whiskeys, that bourbon. This is bourbon-esque, but it's not bourbon. So you will get, you will get those uh, characteristics coming through of the sweet corn. You're gonna get the burnt sugar, the burnt caramel coming through, and, and the red fruits as well in this whiskey. But you're going to get a, a really sweet dram. Beautiful sweet sweetness coming through, the caramel. And for bourbon, you only need 51% corn. Here you got 95. So corn is really the dominant uh, grain that's in this particular whiskey. And with the, with the, uh, the barley, you add a little bit of a character, a little bit of uh, robustness in there, and, and the sweetness and for the enzymes. And uh, with this whiskey, you can see uh, what the coffee column still can do with basically a single grain. You know, and, and, and you know, it's not so, it's not washed out. There's a lot of flavor. There's a lot of components coming through in this whiskey. Uh, it, it's quite a quite a nice whiskey if you're a fan of this type of whiskey and the sweetness of, of it as well. It's a rich American whiskey. And like I mentioned before, the Japanese don't share their whiskey. They don't share the casks with anybody. So you have to make you have to make all kinds of different whiskeys in house to be able to be creative, to be able to come up with new whiskeys. And this is where the blending comes in because. Uh, blending uh, is very, very important, even if you're making single malt. Right? Now, here's the, the blenders. Um, the, it says leads innovation. So, when you have really high, good blending skills, you can create different things. You can innovate, you can, you can progress, you can evolve. Right? It's, and you can also, with the traditional styles, you can make them better all the time. This is why it's, it, the blending is, is so, so important. That's Takasuru with his uh, nephew there. Uh, it, it, he, he never, they never had any kids. On the right, Takasuru and uh, his nephew. And uh, the, he's gone now. Tadashi is Akuma. He, he, he left last year. But he was the, the master blender. So the blenders, these guys, they go to all over the world, and that's where they get. They go to Spain to get the sherry cask. And they go to uh, the United States to get the bourbon cask. They go everywhere to get all their, uh, their, their product. And th like I said, the blending is to develop new products and maintain and improve existing products. So if you have something that is really good, you want to make it better, and how are you going to make it better? By adding something or subtracting something. And that's where the blending skills come in. And then again, designing for the future, what you're gonna create in the future is very, very important. Blending is so important for that. Now, to make the coffee grain or to make a single malt whiskey, it's not just a couple of barrels here and there. You have to have, Nika uses about 
20 different types of grain whiskey to make the coffee grain and 20 different types of single malt malt whiskeys to make a single malt like Yuichi or Mihegiki. You know, some are aged in uh, uh, sherry casks, some are uh, bourbon casks, refilled, remade, different ages, four, six, eight, ten years of age, seven. So all those components, all these different types of uh, casks and age statements are going go into making that one single, single malt. Yeah, you, whether it's Yuichi or Mihigikyo, or whether it's coffee grain. It's not three or four barrels, it's 20 different types. So you imagine the skills that you need to be able to blend something based on the particular flavor profile you're trying to attain. Now, you can't go out and get a sherry cask from your neighbor or a bourbon cask from your other neighbor. You have to have all that in-house. This is why they make so many different types of whiskeys, because they don't share. That's the, that's the important factor about Japanese whiskey. Maybe in the future they might start doing that because I think they, you can see the value. Of and Tino, is that, is that based on that, that just set the competitive nature of, especially the origins of, of Japanese whiskey? Possibly, yeah. Possibly there's, there's that competitive nature of Japanese, that's that for sure. Because um, if you have something good, you don't want to share with anybody. You know? yeah. if you're onto something, yeah. So that's, that's why they do it. But I think maybe it might change in the future. But it, it, it's quite amazing that you can see here 20 different types of iterations of whiskeys go into making one single type of whiskey based on the profile that you wish to obtain. Okay, now we're going to try the. Is that out yet? <laughs> there you go, okay. Is there any, uh, any questions regarding blending and, and these types of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, because I, I was quite fascinated when I learned that, you know, like sometimes people think that a single malt just comes from a barrel. But if it does, if it's a single barrel whiskey. The next whiskey that we're trying here today is called From the Barrel. Uh, this is the signature whiskey of, uh, of Nika. It's the best known whiskey of Nika. Uh, in, in fact, uh, just uh, this month uh, in... Uh, in um, Spirit Business Magazine. It was rated as the number one bar whiskey in the world, and the also the number one trending bar whiskey in the world. Uh, and it's this particular one. Uh, this really interesting whiskey. Uh, it, it's a fantastic uh, whiskey. Um, it's a blended whiskey. What they do here is they will get the grain whiskey, about 65% of grain whiskey, and they blend it with 35% of the Yoichi and Miyagikyo of single malts. What they do is they blend it together and then they recast it. It's kind of like a double maturation. So they recast it to allow, uh, uh, the, uh, they call it a marriage. It allows for all the, the components of the whiskeys to melt together. And um, at, the, at the end, after six months, uh, it's bought right from the barrel at cast strength, 51.5% uh, alcohol. So it's a good marriage because there's no divorce at the end. So you have a really good whiskey. So, <laughs> so the dominant oak in this one is ex bourbon cask in, this, in, in, in the components of this whiskey. And all equal parts of New American oak, ex sherry, refill, remade, and rechar. So you're going to get the components of the coffee grain, the sweetness of the grain coming through, right? Then you're going to get uh, the bourbon characteristics, which again is, is the, the corn-based bourbon. You're gonna, you're gonna get the sweetness of, of the corn, a little bit of the peat and char coming from that as well. You get that in, in the whiskey. Uh, you will get the, the red fruits from the sherry, right? You're gonna get some vanilla characteristics, some spiciness from the American oak. And then the refill remain the rechar give the, the whiskey the opportunity to evolve in its own and allow the grains to, uh, evolution of the grains to evolve on their own. So it's really complex whiskey. It's, it's quite a big whiskey. It's, it is powerful. It's, it's powerful, it's got structure, it's got complexity. Uh, try it on, it on your on its own first, and then try it adding a little bit of water. It makes a big difference as well. 
when you add the water, it really opens it up a lot. So give it a try and see if you can, you can get a lot of those characteristics in this, in this uh, whiskey. Over the past 15 years, this was the whiskey that started it all in, uh, in BC, and then in 2009, and then 2010 in Alberta, and I think it was 2014 when we brought that here into uh, Manitoba. Nicino? Yes. If I may, there is a problem with this whiskey. Not enough? We should be honest with people. 500 ml. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, well, at 500 ml, it's uh, $68. If it was for well, like 700, it would be probably 90. So it yeah. really is a 90 dollar uh, I know that the United States, uh, they're allowed now to have 750, but when it was first introduced in the, in the United States, they actually did have a 750 ml bottle of this particular whiskey uh, for, for the United States. But I, they, they might be the U.S. allows There are a few that just come to the water, like the pure yeah. 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 yeah, those, yeah. What we, yeah, we used to have, some of you may have known that the pure ball black or pure ball white or red, they may have seen it. Those are discontinued whiskeys. And the reason why they discontinued them is because they had some foreign uh, whiskey in them. To, to be non compliant, to be compliant, they decided to discontinue them. Uh, five, five years ago, four or five years ago, one at the Whiskey Advocate Top 20, number one best whiskey in the world. Because this was rated really number one, which is quite an accomplishment for a $68 whiskey. Uh, great, great, great whiskey. Nicino, what was that? What, what, what award was that? Like, and that's the um, Whiskey Advocate Top 20. Oh, and uh, it was rated as number one. I, I, hope, um, I hope that this whole evening has been enlightening. And I was just chatting uh, with Will, and we we're talking about, uh, I think Will's a neat fan too, and we kind of just sit back and realize that we've done a great tasting with Nika, and we've gone through the, you know, the range. Um, and I don't know if many of you know, but you, know, you talk to people outside of Manitoba, yeah, and these aren't easy to find um, in certain markets. And they, they'll tell you, know, YouTube guys doing this, oh, this is hard to find. And we've got five right here in Manitoba. <laughs> I, got, I picked up five at Sage Creek. Just went to Sage Creek, but all five. So, I, I think we're, we're, we don't realize it was a little bit spoiled. You guys now, after, after the presentation and the tasting, I think realize that these are some pretty damn good whiskeys. And um, I think we should just all raise a glass to Natino for making this uh, happen. Well, Cheers. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Yeah. But My also, thank you guys for making time on a Sunday to come on and do this. So, uh, give yourself a pat on the back and thank you all. We're going to move on to something very, very special. This is called, uh, this is part of the Nika Discovery Series. This is the third uh, edition. It is 21, 22, and 23. The third edition is called The Grain. Now, this is, uh, was produced in celebration of the 60th anniversary of the column still that we talked about earlier. And, uh, and this also is new uh, features new grain whiskies from the first time that you guys will hear about this two new distilleries that we been working with moji and satsumasu kasa took me a while to learn that <laughs> <laughs> so uh so it's really interesting whiskey uh this one here so just to uh review the uh, distilleries uh you have Yoichi on the North Island in Hokkaido, uh, right by Sapporo. That was the 1934 distillery. And then there's the Mihedikyo distillery on the South Island in Sendai, north of Tokyo. And that was built in 1969. And the, the two new distilleries that they're working with now are Moji distillery and Satsumatsukasa distillery, both at the very, very south end of, uh, of Japan. 
Uh, at these two distilleries, let's see if it's on here. Yes, okay. No, 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 no. Here they are. So, um, the Moji distillery was uh, in, uh, acquired in 19, uh, sorry, in 2017, and there they make sochu, rum liqueur, and grain whiskey. The Satsuma Sukasa was acquired in 2018, and there they make sho uh, shochu and grain whiskey as well. So at this distillery, they make shochu. Now, a lot of the whiskey, some of the, not a lot, but some of the whiskey that you see today, Japanese whiskey, are basically done in like shochu uh, plants, and they're, from there, they just age them like a whiskey, and they call those whiskeys. That, that's some of those Japanese whiskeys are doing. Okay, so in this particular, the grain special whiskey that you have, Nishi Nomiya was a distillery that now is now closed. It was an operation from 1964 to 1998. And in this particular uh, blend that you have here today, the grain, they have whiskeys. Actually, I should go to the next slide. Nishi Nomiya, okay. Now, Nishi Nomiya, they have coffee grain whiskeys that were that were distilled in 1988. So these are 35 year old whiskeys in this whiskey that you're, that you're gonna to try today. Some coffee grain whiskey from 1988 and also coffee malt that we talked about earlier about they were able to make a malt whiskey in that particular coffee grain this, uh, uh, column still. They're the only people in the world, I think, today that make malt whiskey in a grain distillery. Because they strip too much flavor away. So those are from 1980. So 35 year old malt and 35 year old coffee grain. Again, the oak is uh, refilled in the hogshead and refilled hogshead for both America. And then we have some, another iteration of Miyagikyo coffee grain done at Miyagikyo distillery with the column still from 2010. So these are 13 year old grain whiskeys and 13 year old malt whiskeys from Miyagikyo that are in this particular brand, different iterations. Now from the new distilleries, Moji, which was acquired in 2017, they use unmalted barley and malt barley. So this is different. Now here they use vacuum, pot still distillation, and atmospheric. Now, vacuum, what is vacuum? Vacuum <clears throat> distillation is lower temperature, slower fermentation. And what happens here, a lot of the flavors are slowly, slowly evaporated, and they're going to the vapors, they're going to the new milk. So you're gonna get a lot of these malt flavors coming through, and they go into the, uh, the new milk. Uh, as opposed to the atmospheric distillation, these are all done in stainless steel uh, pot stills. Uh, the atmospheric distillation is much higher temperature, it's faster, and it's not as, not as flavorful. It doesn't take all the flavors with it. The vacuum allows for a lot more of the natural flavors of the grain to come through. And here we have uh, the, uh, the grain whiskeys. Uh, from uh, unmalted and malted barley uh, in Richard Hogshead. Okay, then it's Sutsu Matsukasa. It's again unmalted barley, malted barley, but here they have both distillations in atmospheric uh, distillation process. And that one was uh, from 2018 grain whiskey. So those whiskeys, that 2017, that's what that's six years, and the 2018 is five years old in this particular iteration in this play. And those are in the recharge hogshead as well. At the Sutsa Matsukasa distillery, they also make a very special corn and rye combination whiskey, where they use corn, rye, and malted barley. Now this is uh, also done in atmospheric uh, hot still, distillation in stainless steel from 2019. So those are four years old. But these ones, they're aged in new barrels new American oak. So you're gonna get the spice and the vanilla from the, the oak, and you're also gonna get the spice from the rye. Okay, got all these combinations. It's, it's really, I tried all these separate. I tried the moji, the Satsuma Tsukasa, and the, and the corn rye one, unbelievable. Uh, on their own, really, really cool. Especially 
the last one which is really good so this particular whiskey that you're tasting today has iterations seven different uh, iterations of those whiskeys done in those uh, pot stills and at those distilleries including 35 year old for, uh, 13 year old six five and four year old whiskeys so really unique whiskey very very interesting limited edition uh, whiskey so there it is so as you can see no egg sherry and no bourbon cask in this one you're going to get the new american oak that you get from the Satsumatsu Casa which was this one here on the far right and all the rest are all the refill, remade, and recharge hogshead barrels. These are older, old barrels, some are 20 to 30 years of age. So these barrels allow for the, the grains that are in the malt and the grains that are in there to evolve on their own. So you're going to get the true flavor of the malt, the unmalted barley leaves, the bulked barley, uh, all the, the rice, uh, the, the, the corn flavors, the malt. Barley's, they're all going to evolve on the road. So you're going to taste the flavors. You're going to get loads of tropical fruit in this. Caramel, vanilla, right? You're going to get peaches and apricots. It's like a compote of these beautiful yellow stone fruits. All, all combined in here, coming through in the, in the flavor profile. Oh, that's it. So let's give it a taste and uh, let me know what you guys think. try to get some of these special uh, whiskeys into the market as well. So once people know about Nika more, they'll be more apt to go out and, and maybe buy it, right? So that's because MBL, you know how they work. So they, they just want stuff to bring it in and they want to be sold. So. Ridiculous, like, I mean, 48% and the alcohol is not even... Yeah, and you're getting really old whiskeys in here. You know, 35 year old whiskeys. Yeah, yeah. Year old whiskeys. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an art. This is an art of blending. This is basically yeah. uh, defines Japanese whiskey. Yeah. 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 Imagine yeah. getting a, a whiskey that's 88 years old, you'd be paying thousands of dollars. Yeah. Uh, not 88 years old, from 1988. You'd be paying thousands of dollars for yeah. a 35 year old whiskey. Yeah. So it's in this blend. It's not all 35 year old, but in the, even the 13th. Right? So it's really, uh, cool. really, really, it's really, really, really great cool. balance, lots of yellow fruits. Uh, it's not about peat or smoke in this whiskey. Not that's, not, that's not what they're doing. Uh, this is a, a grain, a beautiful complex grain whiskey with loads of apricots and peaches and those kinds of things. Vanilla and caramel. Okay. Beautiful whiskey. So if you're a fan of this kind of whiskey, it's, it's a great whiskey. Nantino, quick question. What's your favorite whiskey cocktail? Hey, whiskey cocktail. Old fashioned. You like old fashioned? Yeah. Yeah. This, with would, this, this would kick ass. Which one? Do you think the, this yeah, particular think one? Yeah. This, is, this is the one? Well, this would be really good for old fashioned. I, I'll say, yeah. Yeah. Cheers to that. But the coffee grain is, makes a really good old fashioned. Yeah. Oh, the coffee yeah. grain, totally, because of all the complexity yeah, and that, yeah. the depth and the layers already present. Yeah, that would be wild. With the Nika that makes a beautiful Oh, yeah. And it's also in the summer, if you want to have it with a fever tree ginger ale and a boost of lemon, it's outstanding. Yeah. 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 I agree, the Nika Days was awesome, and I got a lot of uh, cocktail yeah, inspiration absolutely. from it right away. Yeah. Even, but it's also drammable. Like it's 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 like a kind of really approachable whiskey. It's got lightness. It's got darkness. It has, yeah. It's very versatile. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the whole idea. Nice, easy, easy whiskey, but also really good with coffee. Yeah. Great. It's awesome. Cheers. Thank you for coming Cheers. again. Cheers. Appreciate you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.